I am Vinny Taller and folks. Here we are again on the Friday show. Your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent when we start this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, just like the guy who's been on this show, I'm going to say for the third time now. And um, for whatever reason, well, I'll talk about the reasons during the show. I was thinking about this guy the entire time I was in the UK um, over the Christmas holidays. He just kept rolling around in my head. So I was sitting there one, one dreary night. Well, there's only dreary nights in England. It rains every day. And I just wrote to him and said, James, you got to come back on the show. And he's, he pretty much said, no, I don't. And I said, no, sir, please. Please go ah, maybe in the summertime. I was like, no, no, I don't think I, I got a problem. You need to come back on folks. I'm talking about the beautiful human being known as James Nestor. How are you doing, man? Doing good. After that intro, this is going to be incredibly disappointing for you. Just a heads up. <laughs> yeah, I, I look forward to having you on because I, I you know, most people that most people go, oh, I like to binge. You know, you hear about binge worthy stuff on television, right? And oh, yeah, you know, I watched every episode of this or that. And I'm watching a soprano. One of the girls, uh, Gina Grad, who does my Sunday school show here, she's gone through the Sopranos, I think, 10 times or more. She just keeps binging the same. Well, I'm the same way with binging. I'm addicted to knowledge, you know, and you can't get knowledge unless you just talk to people. And every time I read anything you've written, or any time I talk to you, I just feel smarter when I'm done. If that makes any sense. Has anyone ever given you that kind of compliment before? No, they haven't. And sometimes it's just the opposite. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm addicted to learning stuff as well. And I'm pretty much a dumbass, uh, which makes my job fun because I don't know about the things I'm going to write about. So I have to go into the field and talk to everybody and figure out the story that way. And it allows me to be more objective, I think, and be in the same line with, with the reader oftentimes. So that's how I approach it. Other people approach things differently, but, but that's, that's how I make, you know, the books and, and the articles over here. Yeah. yeah. By the way, folks, uh, he writes for outside uh, and, and several other publications to name a few. He's written books like get high now and in parentheses without drugs. Uh, he's written a book called uh, Deep. It's about free diving. And um, we talked about that the first time he was on. I don't think we got into deep the second time he was on, but very, very interesting book. Um, he, he also has written a book called Breathe. And we're going to be talking about that book today. Even though we talked about it once before on this show, something came up and it was disturbing me, as I said, over the Christmas holidays. Uh, but before we get into that, we always have to backtrack because you are kind of like a modern day George Plimpton. Um, and I might have complimented you with that before. Um, or for, all right, for the rest of the audience. <laughs> Plimpton was this guy who would go and just emerge himself, like with football teams, you know, pro football teams and just get in there and see what it was all about. He, he was like, he would be part of the team. And then he would go and write about it. Uh, you, James, kept hearing about Wim Hof, about this crazy guy who was just dipping into cold water and laying down in snow and, you know, climbing stuff with, in his underwear. And you just had to go and check it out. Uh, now, we've talked about it before, but it's such a fascinating story. And I just saw Wim Hof again. Uh, I was watching Real Sports. I don't know if you caught that episode. Um, but... You know, or were you in that episode? No, you weren't in it. No, they, they had their guy go and kind of do what you did, but you liked. I mean, you actually went there and did the whole course. Can you speak to that? Well, Wim Hof is just one of many different breathing therapists. You can call them breathing gurus, uh, breathing nuts, pulmonots, I call them in my book, who are just tapping into these ancient methods of controlling your respiration to get your mind in certain places, to get your body in certain places, to heat yourself up, to actually heal yourself of chronic conditions. 
measurably heal yourself of chronic conditions. And so it wasn't just whim that inspired me to take a deeper look into all of this. It was the idea that we as a species have lost the ability to breathe correctly. And a lot of people say, oh, that's total BS. Here I am. I'm alive. I'm breathing. But compensation is different from being healthy. You know, you can eat 20 Big Macs a day and stay alive for, for a little while before your body breaks down. So we're just getting by um, breathing the way that we are breathing. And we're suffering from so many chronic respiratory problems and so many other problems because of it. So that's what really got me interested. Not just whim, not just the, the crazy stuff. Here's this guy who can sit in ice for two hours and not get hypothermia or frostbite. Amazing, totally amazing. But what's the other stuff that other people can do just around the house while you're exercising, while you're sleeping, that can really improve your health and, some, and sometimes transform you um, from, from one state of being to another. And that's what really inspired me to write this book. Well, you know, I took a piece of your advice uh, from the last time we spoke, and it, it really works for me. I've always claimed that I hate being cold. You know, I... If it's even mildly chilly, I'm I'm the guy, you know, I look in my hands are really cold. My feet get really cold. I'm just that guy. Um, my whole family's from the Mediterranean, you know, the lower part. Where, you know, it, I, I grew up in southern Louisiana. It was always hot. Uh, I did all these races out in the desert, 500-mile nonstop bicycle races where they everyone claimed that when it got really hot past 110 degrees out there, Vinny would speed up. Well, Vinny wasn't speeding up. I just wasn't slowing down as much as the other guys. I was able to, you know, heat as my friend um, to the point where I've developed one of the world's best, you know, um, electrolyte supplements to help people with, with that situation. But when I would go out to the skeet field, which is one of my passions is to get really good at skeet. And I live in a cold environment. You know, it's not really cold, but it's Virginia in the wintertime. It could be 25 degrees out there. And of course, if you put too much clothing on, you can't, you, you can't get the gun up and, you know, you, it's hanging up on the clothing and, and whatever. So, you know, I like to just have like a sweater, a nice sweater on with maybe some wool underneath. And man, when it's 25 degrees, I would always be out there, you know, shaking. I had these Zippo hand warmers in my pockets to keep my hands to where I can feel them. And then last year, after we had that conversation, I said, you know, James said something about just relaxing into it, breathe, you know, just breathe through your nose, let it breathe, you know, breathe in, breathe out. And that technique has actually taught me to warm up when I'm cold. Uh, can you go through a little bit and give the audience an idea of what's happening to me and why am I able to now control it just by breathing through my nose? Sure. What you're experiencing isn't some new age thing. It's not a placebo effect. It's just our basic physiology. And if it sounds too good to be true, all you have to do is measure it. So what happens when we breathe through our mouths is we tend to breathe too much. And when we breathe too much, we tend to offload too much carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide plays a vital, essential role in circulation, in the vasodilation of our blood vessels. So if you don't have enough CO2, your blood vessels shrink up like this. Guess why your hands are getting cold and your feet are getting cold? Because you don't have enough circulation to these areas, which is why if you then went into a sauna, everything would get very hot. Why does it get very hot? And why does that numbness go away? Because you have circulation to those areas. So you can trick your breathing in certain ways. You can hack into it to increase your carbon dioxide, which is actually very healthy and actually shift the blood flow in your body to different parts of your body. Some people are so good at this that they can do this on a single hand, on their hand. They can shift the blood flow. A lot of us aren't that good, uh, nowhere near that good, but what we can do is breathe very slowly, breathe through the nose. When you feel cold, you can do breathing techniques of holding your breath, exhaling longer than you're inhaling, all of those things help you get that healthy balance of CO2 up, which increases circulation. Yeah. And, you know, look, I, I didn't, I didn't even remember that much of it. I just remembered, wait, 
Stop breathing through your mouth, breathe through your nose. Uh, you know, look, I just did, I'm going to brag here. I just did two hours and five minutes of my concept two. Um, that was my aerobics for today. And of course I have a strap on, you know, strap on. That sounds weird. <laughs> I'm wearing a strap in order to, uh, you know, keep my heart rate at a certain rate. I want to stay in zone two. And um, I also breathe every breath unless I'm drinking water through my nose. Um, and by the way, one helps the other. Because if I get into zone three and zone four, the mouth has to come open at some point, the mouth is going to gape open, right? I, I can't get enough through my nose. I know you're saying I, I I'm just saying I can't. Um, sure. Which is another question for you, because I read somewhere in one of your books, it had to be in your books, because you're the only breathing guy. You talked about one nostril, one side of the nostril working, and then that shuts off in the other side. Well, on my right side, I have a deviated septum, I broke my nose twice. And so the septum is kind of closed off. And if I get up to 80, 82, 85% of my aerobic capacity, if it's on that side, good luck with me keeping my mouth closed, I'm suffocating at some point. W what is that? Can you explain that science and why it works that way? So you're really in tune with your body. You're in tune with your airways. You know what's going on. Most people are not. And everybody breathes slightly differently, which is why it's hard to give these blanket prescriptions. You hear these people saying, you just have to breathe like this, you know, when you're into zone four, you just have to breathe like this when you're in zone two, you should be nasal breathing as much as you possibly can to the very limit. If you slip into mouth breathing on occasion, it's totally fine. But most of your exercise should be nasal breathing. That's really hard for people like you and like me and with other people who have broken their nose and have a severely deviated septum or have nasal polyps or whatever. So once you acknowledge that and understand that, you can feel where your threshold is and you can use mouth breathing as a tool. Mouth breathing is not your default. Go out on a street, at least I was just doing this, walking around San Francisco, every single jogger I see Every single one of them, even if they're jogging at, you know, three miles per hour, they're going. <sighs> <sighs> that is awful for the body. It's awful for exercise. It's awful for the lungs. It's awful for the brain on and on and on. So at, at zones up to upper part of zone three, zone four, zone five. Yes, yeah, some mouth breathing is OK, but most most of it should happen through the nose. Now, you're talking about the difference between right nostril and left nostril and having a uh, severely deviated septum. What our noses do throughout the day is they naturally cycle. So every 30 minutes to three to four hours, one nostril will be dominant, which means it will be more open than the other one. Sometimes for a short period of time, both are very open, but usually it's biased on one side of the other. And that doesn't so much uh, affect your exercise because when you're exercising and you're <laughs> the tissues will respond to that volume of breath and tend to open up more. So that nasal cycling is much more pronounced when you're at rest, when you're sleeping, that kind of thing. But it is absolutely measurable. It affects our heart rate, our circulation, the heat in our body, even uh, brainwave activity. Um, that's, that's what those different channels of your nose do. And when you're breathing through the mouth, you don't get any of that. Remind me. And again, you know, I, I always say I have a partial photographic memory of what I read. And I read your, your book so long ago, the breathing book. Um, you talked about evolution at some point. Was it you or was it the, the paleoanthropologist book? I think it was you uh, that talked about uh, over time, because we became mouth breathers, our the roof of our mouth and maybe our teeth and everything else is not perfect the way they used to be. What, what am I? What am I remembering there? Yeah. So if you go and look at ancient skulls, which is something I did for months and months, I have a weird job. I warned you about that. But you look at ancient skulls, and it doesn't matter if they're from Africa, Southeast Asia. North America, South America, Polynesia, I don't care. Anywhere on the planet before industrialization, 
we all had straight teeth. Okay. Why did we all have straight teeth? We never had wisdom teeth yanked out or braces or headgear or retainers. We didn't need any of that. We had straight teeth because our mouths were so big. They were wide enough to accommodate all our teeth and teeth will grow in straight when the mouth is big enough. What happened in industrialization is our mouth started growing so small that teeth had to fight for room. So they grew in crooked. What's the other problem with having a mouth that's too small for your face? You have a smaller airway. How does that affect your nasal breathing? Well, the upper palate here pushes into the sinus cavities, makes it hard to breathe through the mouth. So you become an obligate nasal breather, all the problems we just talked about. But actually breathing through the mouth when you're growing up in early stages of development will change your facial shape and make it harder for you to breathe through your nose later on in life. And that's exactly what we've seen across the entire world's populations that have been in the industrial world. There's still a few hunter-gatherer cultures. There's still a few indigenous cultures that don't eat our crap food, that don't sit and watch Netflix all day. And they have none of these problems. Their teeth are perfectly straight. Their, be their breathing is beautiful. I remember... I want to say, yeah, it had to be college. This was too sophisticated for high school. They were talking, it was a psychology class I was in. And I'm trying to bring the class back into my brain right now. But there was, uh, and by the way, this was not something we read. It was a, a, a visiting professor who, a lecturer who was talking about this. And I thought it was very interesting at the time. He, he was making a connection between thumb sucking and guys who ended up in prison. Do you know anything about this? I mean, yeah. and the reason was, is when you suck your thumb, it causes the, when your mouth is, you know, in, in those years when your mouth is still forming, the bones are still, you know, forming, there's more plasticity, I guess, in your bones. You suck your thumb and it causes more of a U up in your, your top, in the top, the roof, roof of your mouth, which takes up some of your nasal cavity, which means that you won't become a prolific athlete and you might be an outcast and that outcast ends up becoming a criminal. And then you find nothing but thumb suckers in college in, 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 in prison. You, you seem to be nodding your head going, Oh my God, uh, do you know this? Is this it's true? A, or? There, there's been a, quite a few people who have said this. Uh, it's an interesting hypothesis. I don't think it's ever been thoroughly studied. What we can do instead of making these huge generalizations, I'm sure you can find people in prison that weren't thumb suckers, right? So, but what you can do is you can look at what happens to the face when you are a thumb sucker, okay? The mouth grows around the thumb. The teeth grow in crooked. Your mouth is very small. It pushes up into the sinus cavities, makes it hard to breathe through the nose. Everything that you were saying, maybe that will uh, make you more apt to be a social outcast. Can we prove that scientifically? No, I don't think we can ever prove that. But we do know that when you breathe through your mouth, there is a disturbance of oxygen in the brain. It affects how you think. It affects your stress levels. It affects anxiety. It affects all of these things. And if you're always breathing through the mouth all the time, I could see how that could make you much more susceptible to suffering from some, some mental problems. But, but this is sticky stuff. You know, this is more uh, psychological uh, hypothesis than, than it is really looking at, at data, things that we can prove in studies. Uh, a subject I don't bring up on the show very often, but, um, you know, you and I were supposed to do the show three weeks ago. Um, you got, as, as my parents would say, you got the COVID. But they got, you know, they always talk about the COVID. Um, do you know which one you got? <laughs> it's like, it's almost like we, we used to say, hey, where'd you get Pfizer? Or did you get, uh, you know, Merck or whatever, whatever you know, the drugs were. Did you get Johnson Johnson? Now we ask people, Oh, did you get original COVID? Did you get Omicron? Did you get Delta? You know, uh, do you know what you got? Do you know how you got it? Any of this stuff? I'm really into vintage stuff. So I was just looking for the old COVID. I don't like yeah. the new stuff. Uh, you know, <laughs> just the classic, the classic one. I don't know which one it was. Uh, it was a couple of days weren't 
you know, I was never incapacitated. A couple of days weren't fun, but uh, they weren't really that bad. The, the worst thing about it was that it just took a while to to leave. I still have a teeny cough, like a dry cough. That's it's almost completely gone. And it was just the fatigue. I what was weird is I never got congestion or a sore throat or anything, but I felt this fatigue. I said, do I have COVID? And I took three tests. I took a test of the city and all of them were blazingly positive. Oh, <laughs> you yeah, know, you still have go pictures home. of it. Yeah, you were sending pictures. <laughs> but look at how pink these two lines are. You know, I've never seen lines this pink in my life. Anybody think? And I'm like, it, you know, it's odd because, you know, when we were in, in the UK, you know, we were staying in a house, I know it sounds weird, with 17 other people. Uh, my sister-in-law, she lives in a, a really big, I think it's a mansion. I don't even know what you would call. I don't know where mansion starts, but when you can house 17 people and no one's in a broom closet, it's a, I guess it's a mansion. And um, all right, 17, everyone, you know, took the PCR test. You know, a lot of us were traveling from other countries to get there. So everyone was all, you know, boosted up and PCR to death and the whole thing. And, no one, we didn't, we weren't around anyone else the entire time, right? And Serena and I were leaving that house after two weeks to go visit her mom, and her mom is old and has some conditions. So we're driving over, and Serena goes, you know, what? I'm going to take a COVID test before I go, and uh, you should too. So we both took COVID tests. She was positive. I wasn't. She had zero symptoms. I had zero symptoms. Um. But then she was like, well, should we sleep in separate bedrooms? I was like, why? We've been sleeping together the entire time. You probably had COVID yesterday. You have no symptoms. You went for a jog yesterday in the rain. You, you were fine. She went for a jog the day she found out, right? She never stopped working out. Well, on day two or three of her COVID, now we're now quarantined in a small hut somewhere. And uh, we're not going to go visit her mom and do all this stuff. And it's just the two of us in, in this little one room kind of cabin. <laughs> and it was, it was kind of romantic other than the fact that she had COVID. And she, you know, I started getting a sore throat because the babies, Kristen's granddaughters, both had a head cold while we were there. I picked up the head cold, right? And I kept going, oh, Serena, I think I, I, think I have the COVID because I'm sick now. I, I feel it coming on. Never got COVID. I was testing every day. I had to take the, the big super duper test to get back on the plane to come back. Serena was clear by then. No COVID by the time we came back. I never got it. I was way more sick than she was with sinus, with sore throat, with couldn't get out. You know, like I, I spent two days in the bed, you know, just getting up just to work and then right back to bed. It, it makes no sense. I did not get COVID. I was sick. Serena had one, some form of COVID, you know, kept going out and jogging. It, it literally makes zero sense. What say you? Well, uh, my wife did not get it. Uh, we live in a house. We, you know, we were sleeping in the same bed. We we're hanging out. It's the winter here. So it's not like the doors were open all the time. She didn't get it at all. And she was testing every single day. I happened to get it. You know, there's everyone thinks we have this all figured out. We still don't, to a large extent, don't know what the hell this thing is doing. Like I was, I, you know, we were told the vaccine, oh, you get the vaccine, you're not going to get COVID. <laughs> everyone that's getting COVID was vaccinated. Yeah. And then so, the, oh, now, now you need a fourth shot. I'm like, what is going on here? So uh, to, to be clear, I, I think partly my body used this as an excuse just to like not answer email for a couple of weeks. I was completely <laughs> burnt out. I was like, it's the start of a new year. I can't get away from anything. I just cleared the decks and had a reboot. I'm happy I had COVID uh, because now I think I'm good to go. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, to go back out into the world. I feel comfortable doing that with, with natural immunity. So I'm thinking i'm hoping that this may be the last big wave because of experiences like you had experiences like i had denmark is called an into it by the way they just said yeah. yeah you know this covid covid thing is gonna be with us forever we're going back to work so and i think other countries are going to do that same thing well you know 
you know, I have friends who say, oh, you can't go into restaurants and you can't go into large crowds. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. Okay, my wife got it in the house with a bunch of other people. No one else in the house got it. No one. Where did she get it from? We didn't go anywhere. The only time we went out was to go, we, we, we walked and jogged in the countryside. Um, we, we actually did what they call an armed shoot. It wasn't an actual shoot, uh, but we, you know, we all went out with shotguns. And if we came across pheasant, you know, if they were flying, we, we shot. Um, I did a different shoot on my own. You know, I went to an actual pheasant shoot a few days later. I was the only one that was around people. Of course, we're in an open field, you know, in Range Rovers. And I guess maybe I could have sat someone in the same Range Rover with someone that might. But I never got it. Where did she get it from? Why did no one else in the house get it? No one. Did someone carry it in? One of the people, one, you know, there were cooks that came in every day. Did, did a cook carry it in, never get the COVID themselves and gave it just to her and no one else? None of it makes sense. That, that, that's the point I'm trying to make here. Yeah, we, we will never know to a large extent. I mean, this this one spreads like wildfire. It just spreads all over the face place. Why, why do some people get it? Why do some people don't? I, I know that, you know, immune system uh, has a lot to do with that. Maybe your wife running out in the rain. She had a weakened immune uh, uh, system at that time when she was susceptible for one moment and walked by someone and, and breathed in. Nobody really knows, you know, and at this yeah. point, I think it, it's if if you have underlying conditions, if you're susceptible, then then don't go to big crowds. Don't go to restaurants like that's that's a bad idea. You yeah. know, it, it's coming down to personal responsibility. I'm not here to tell someone what to do. And uh, it's it's about, uh, you know, we've been this thing has been with us for for two years. It's it's killed millions and millions of people. It's a yeah. serious thing. And uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, but but at this stage, we're hoping uh, at least this is what the epidemiologists have been saying. It will be around forever, but it's just going to get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker, just like the flu. You know, we get a flu shot for the flu, which is 100 years old. That's from the Spanish flu. That's yeah. that's what the flu shot is from. I think COVID's going to be the same thing. Well, there you have it. One more shot we need to take every year. <laughs> Lucky us. Yeah. Folks. The one shot I like to take all the time is a shot of Villa Capelli olive oil. That's right. I actually drink the stuff. I've done it on this show. I've done it on camera. People don't believe it. And I actually have people saying to me all the time, do you really, really drink the stuff? Yes. Uh, when I was doing a lot of sea kayaking before I made my, uh, my nut butters, um, I would take that stuff with me sea kayaking because I'd put it in little vials and I put it right into my, my life jacket. And uh, whenever I wanted something to eat out there, and by the way, I would always put a little salt in it because it made it taste almost like a caprese salad. I would take it out. I would juice down two ounces of it. If I had an ounce, some of those vials were one ounces. I, I would just do the whole ounce. It really works. Uh, and boy, if you really want it to work for you, put it on your food, use it to cook, put it in your salads. Villa Capelli, there's no seed oils whatsoever in this olive oil. It's 100% pure. It comes from Puglia, Italy, Paul Capelli, God rest his soul. And uh, his husband, uh, Stephen Crutchfield, started this company. And they never wavered. They never take cheap olive oil from Greece or anywhere else. They, they have the good stuff. Villa Capelli Olive Oil, the longest running sponsor of this show. Uh, you want to save a couple of bucks. I tell everyone, first and foremost, spend about $110. Tell you why in a minute, but you want to spend about $110. You'll get the free shipping that way. Um, and you also get the three liter 10 when you buy bulk. Of course, you're going to get it for cheaper. So there's two ways to save. But the third and biggest way to save is to get 10% off by putting in promo code Vinny, V I N N I E, promo code Vinny, V I N N I E, no wimpy Y. You will get your Villa Capelli. Um, for third, for ten percent off, that's why I said one hundred and ten because that'll drop it down to a hundred. Then you'll still have that that discount on uh, discount free shipping. It's not a discount; it's free. Wow, the money you can save! I use this stuff in my vitamin D product over at purevitaminclub.com. That's how serious I am about Villa Capelli. 
I actually contract with those guys and use it in my own products at my vitamin company, villacapelli.com, promo code Vinny. And we're talking to the guy who wrote books like Breathe and books like Deep and books like Get High Now, just to name a few. Uh, he's written articles everywhere. Um, brag about yourself just for a second, James. Well, I want to bring something up about Get High Now without drugs. Very yeah. important, that second part. That was never the title of the book. This book was looking at these different methods. It was a book based on medical science and physiology and biology. And I thought, oh, it's going to be like this cool coffee table book. You can pick it up, read a couple of things. The editor gave it that name. I said, dude, I don't want this on my gravestone. Please don't name it that. He said, okay, well, we'll talk about it here. Next thing I know, it's off to print. So that is why that book has that title. So uh, when you make bad decisions, they haunt you throughout your entire life. Everybody, don't do what I've done. However, I will say the book is, uh, you know, there's some interesting forays into actual science and biology. I'm not trying to sell the book. I'm just trying to give context to it. So well, that's it. That's my that, bragging. That makes sense, James. But you've also written, I know you, you've written for Outside and um, I think you told me Scientific America, but uh, you've written for other other magazines, right? And that's well, that's used to be my jam. That used to be my thing. Um, and I loved it. I wrote for Outside, New York Times, uh, Atlantic, uh, Scientific American, uh, Surfer's Journal, uh, always fun to write for them. But uh, I'll, I'll be honest that there is no way to even vaguely make even a semi quasi living writing for magazines nowadays. That entire industry has collapsed, which is really sad because yeah. you, you felt like a, you know, you were a, a seal on a mission. You have one month to go figure out the story, talk to everyone, come back, write it up. And I love that challenge to dipping your toes into something and coming back out. But once I discovered books and writing longer books, narrative nonfiction, science books, now this is where, you know, I put all my, my energy and my, my heart is. I absolutely love it. Even if, James, if like outside online or any of those came to you, there's no money in writing those articles that you can't eke out something? There would be money if you were living in Namibia and, uh, you know, alone um, and we're paying, you know, a hundred <laughs> bucks a month on, on your shack. I live in San Francisco. Okay. Um, this place is uh, insanely expensive. And, uh, you know, I supplemented my my lifestyle as a, freelance writer by, you know, building up my home over, over numerous years and, and doing very, try to creative things to keep things afloat. But then you get older and you're just like, good God, I need to do something. Even though I love that work. I love magazine writing so much. Yeah. The, the amount of money is so small that really I'm going to get my ass kicked for, for saying this, but most of who is writing these stories now are people who have other sources of income. Either they work other jobs, they're, they have trust funds, they have rich partners. Nothing wrong with that. I wish I had all that. I don't. Yeah. So my job is how I get all my money. Uh, I don't have any other source. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, look, I'm, I know my buddy, uh, Gary Taubes, who doesn't live far from you. He's got to keep writing books. You know, he the guy used to write for newspapers and everything else. And Gary, when he wakes up in the morning, he's got to start jotting something down on a piece of paper and figure out his next book or he sunk. And just like you, I mean, it, not cheap real estate up around your area. Well, and, and you're talking about top tier journalist, right? He's he's at the, the very top of the top and his books are huge sellers. They've changed the way we understand fats, right? They've changed yeah. our understanding of the keto diet. He was the first 20 years ago. So watershed stuff here and he's still grinding away. So, so even for when you've made it to that level, yeah, you know, the world's getting more competitive. To, to me, I kind of like having a fire on my butt. I kind of like something that forces me to go out and really, really do it and apply myself. So I don't find that that's a big problem. I think it becomes a problem when people sort of 
have too much luxury in their life, uh, then they tend to get a little lazy. I've seen that with a few friends who have made a, a ton of money in, in you know, the startup world here. But uh, I, I kind of like um, having a, a reason to get up in the morning, get my butt kicked and going out into the world and figuring stuff out. Yeah, it, look, we're, we're all doing the same thing. You know, <laughs> like I said, I put three movies out in three years and, you know, people are always asking me, so when are you going to put the next one out? And it's like, F you, J just really F you, because you, you talk to people making documentaries, they'll say, oh, it took me 10 years to get one documentary done. Uh, I happen to have this crazy, crazy work ethic. Um, and I'm too dumb to not know what I don't know. You know, so I just go, okay, I wake up in the morning and go, guess anyone can make a movie. And I think some of that comes from my clientele in Hollywood. You know, it's like, I, I you know, these people were living in mansions and they were making some of the worst movies out there. I'm going, this guy's an idiot. And he, he's living in this and driving that and sleeping with her. R really? How did all that happen? You know, just because he can make a stupid movie. And then I realized, wait, you can make documentaries. It's not that, that difficult. It's not rocket science so maybe that's your next calling james well you you can now uh you know 20 years ago 30 years ago really hard to make documentaries because completely different equipment and i find it very liberating that all of this stuff is accessible to us writing books actually writing magazine articles this is one of the most lo-fi cheap things cheap overhead things to do you can work in a cafe all you need is a computer. You don't even need a computer. You get a typewriter, you write it on a notepad. So you're just using your brain and it takes an incredible amount of time, but, but it's, it's, uh, it doesn't require a huge staff of people. Movies are, are a very different thing, but, but that is becoming more streamlined because technology is getting cheaper. And I find that, that that's so exciting because people can tell stories in a different way who weren't able to do that otherwise. Yeah. And look, I, I even look at I, I don't know what the name of the movie was going to be, but uh, I get oh, the movie Rust, where the, the, the young uh, photographer got shot accidentally. And when, you know, I've watched a couple of docu not documentaries, but uh, 2020 and some of these things, because I'm like, how did a bullet get on the set? You know, I'm always interested in that sort of thing. And all you hear from these Hollywood types that were on the set, you know, the grips, this guy, that guy, the, the, the assistants, they were going, they were doing everything on the cheap. They were doing everything. You know, we, we, we had never seen things done this cheaply. And I don't think people realize that everyone's making a movie on a budget nowadays. You know, Netflix has this insatiable appetite, Hulu, Amazon, they all have these insatiable appetites. And, you know, these stars are seeing, wait, if I can go out and do this cheap enough, and put together a production company, I can then get something out there, you know, you, you have to stay relevant, right? Nobody's taking time, they're not doing it right anymore. And somehow, because of that, a live bullet ends up on a set, and then it ends up in this poor woman's chest cavity. And, and you know, it's, you know, we look around and go, what happened? And, was, and from what I could tell, it's like, well, what didn't happen? <laughs> right? Like, you know, so many things went wrong. And it wasn't just the bullet and the gun, everyone is talking about all the problems that were on that set. There are movies being done right now, thousands of them, thousands, right? And I got a feeling there's a lot of corners being cut and there's going to be more of this stuff. You know, it's just not, it's not fair. Which is another great thing about writing stuff. You, it's you. Uh, there's yeah. no one else to blame when, when you're late. There's no one to blame when your manuscript sucks. There's no one to blame when you don't have any. And I like that. You know, I've worked with teams of people. I've had great experiences. I've also had terrible experiences. And it's it's consistent when you wake up in the morning and it's just you doing the work. That's what it comes down to. Uh, really spending, I spend years and years on books. I know other people write, write other books, other kinds of books, and that's awesome. And it works great for them. But I know Gary Taubes is, is another, another person that guy digs in and, and yeah. it, it takes him years to turn out a book. So I love the process. I've honestly missed that. Uh, I haven't been in that zone and I look forward to going back into it. Well, I'm always excited to see what you're going to do next. Before I let you go, I promised I wouldn't keep you forever. Um, the product I kept seeing, I started seeing it a while, you know, in, in the fall when we were going into the Christmas season. I saw it a couple of times. 
it would show up in my Instagram feed. <clears throat> I guess I'm one of the people that what they, you know, everyone knows what you're going to buy. They see what you're looking at. You know, uh, maybe my wife was looking at a new um, a Garmin watch, or maybe I was looking at a new pair of running shoes or something and they figure out who you are. And then all of a sudden your Instagram, your, I don't go to Facebook anymore, but at Twitter, no matter where I was online, if I just pressed down on Google, I kept seeing the arrow fit. Have, have you seen this product out there? Oh yeah, of course. Yep. And they, you know, they kept claiming over and over and over. It's like, Hey, just sit down, you know, put this $300 device into your mouth for a couple of minutes a day. And you will have incredible lungs, uh, lungs like an Olympic athlete. And it's all these crazy claims. And they were talking about the percentage of capacity that your lungs can gain just by breathing through this device. And when I started seeing those types of, you know, 10%, wait a minute, <laughs> if I can raise 10%, I, I at, at 59 years old, I can probably be in the Olympics again. Right. And, and this, this can't be true. This can't be right. I'm saying Olympics again, I, I could be at an Olympic level athlete. I've never been to the Olympics, but I could think about it again. And um, I'm looking at that going, if this is true. So I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm, I'm it's like, you, you're just you, you're, you're constricting, you know, you're bringing your diaphragm down, you're doing all this stuff, you, you can't possibly, this can't possibly work. Why can it not possibly work? I need to speak to James Nestor. <laughs> so here we are. This is my big question for you today, James. What is this product? It's $300. It can't possibly, in my opinion, from what I've read, there is no science that's proving this. What say you? I hate to burst your bubble here, oh, but, boy. and I love to call BS on stuff. No, if it works, I'm going, I'm going to go get one. If, if you're telling most me of what they're saying is a hundred percent true. And it turns out that, you know what, here it is. Here was a book for those not looking at this. Uh, I realize this is audio, but there is a book written by Dr. Allison McConnell. This came out in the early 2000s, and it is all about what inspiratory muscle training can do for athletic performance. And I open this up randomly right here. And here we are, uh, increase of time trials, 4% increase after four weeks, a 4% increase for a professional athlete. That is enormous. That's, that's crazy. Look, let me right? give the audience an idea of how big that is. When Lance Armstrong and company would take uh, performance enhancing drugs, they were looking for 1% gain. 1%. It was yep. 4%. I, I hate to say it, but I mean, I'm leafing through this now. You can see it right here. She is legit. She's done the work. This book is available. So what this company did is they looked at this, this science, this research, which has been so under considered in athletic performance breathing has it, it it's so crazy to think we get most of our energy through our breath and yet when you talk about athletic training so many trainers don't even look at how their athletes are breathing and this is can be one of the most transformational performance enhancing things you can ever do for performance and here's the proof inspiratory muscle training is just one part of it that's what she focuses on, and that's what the AeroFit does. It's interesting to note that I've got all this stuff in my office here. You can buy this thing, which is basically the analog version of AeroFit, and does the same thing. It's about 15 bucks on Amazon. It doesn't link in through Bluetooth to your phone. Um, it doesn't give you exercises, but it does the same thing. They have found that five minutes of breathing with one of these things per day can lower blood pressure more than any other treatment. Really? Period. Yes. Five minutes a day. You have to do it for a number of weeks. Okay. This isn't a one and done. I'm good to go. Give me some salt. Right. Uh, you, you have to, just like with any fitness, you, you can go and work out one day. You, you're, you're good to go. No, you have to keep up with it. And it's all about building. We have about 11 pounds of muscles in a respiratory system that allow us to breathe. 
And this is about building those muscles. And by building those muscles, you build lung capacity, bigger lungs, fewer breaths, more oxygen, more efficiency. So they're on the right path. I've used the AeroFit. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to bag on them too much, but it's not right for me. Um, I like this thing, uh, mostly because it's 15 bucks and uh, it's simple. And you just have to be uh, conscious of, of how you're breathing and stay with it. This isn't a, I'm going to do this for three days. I'm going to do this for five days. You have to stay with it for weeks and weeks before you really start seeing that change. But once you see it, it can, as this book and this research and so uh, many let, other Let's talk about the book. The book yeah. is called Breathe. I can't see it. Uh, hold it's it up. called Breathe, Breathe Strong, Perform Better by Dr. Allison McConnell. And there are, I think, a few hundred studies she's, she's mentioning here. You can buy this book. It's old now. You know, it's 20 years old. But you can also just go on PubMed at the National Institute of Health and put in inspiratory muscle training athletics, inspiratory muscle training diabetes, inspiratory muscle training cardiovascular disease. And hundreds and hundreds of studies are out there showing how effective this is. Okay, now you've brought up several more questions. Um, the AeroFit, uh, I mentioned that uh, the Bluetooth version is a, a close to a $300 item. I did notice on their website when, I, you know, when Serena had COVID and I was sitting in a hut in the middle of uh, the UK, that they have like a $75 version, but it doesn't, it's kind of like your analog version there. Um, you, you're not a fan, you said you're not a fan of the AeroFit, for what reason? Okay, I, I do not want to, I do not endorse any products and I don't want to bag on any products. No, 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 in, no, we're in, not bagging, I just in, want the truth here. Okay, in anyone who is making people more aware of their breathing and allowing them to live better by harnessing the power of their own body gets a gold star from me. I don't want to criticize any of that. For the AeroFit itself, the functionality, I wasn't a big fan of. It's a lot of bells and whistles, but I just want to do the thing. It, it comes down to doing the work, you know, you, you can look at all these animations and all this stuff, but what are the benefits from inspiratory muscle training? It's from inhaling, having that pressure. So I have found for some people who can be more of a self-starter, you can buy something like this, the analog version for 15, 20 bucks okay. on Amazon. What is that product called? There, there's a zillion of these. There's, there's dozens. Inspiratory muscle training. You put that into, I don't want to keep mentioning Amazon, put that online and you can, there are various versions of this, of an inspiratory muscle trainer. So, and you can get the, the ones with, you know, digital readouts and all that stuff. There's also a product called Power Breathe, which is exactly the same thing as AeroFit. Works great. It's inspiratory muscle training. That's what it is. And Power Breathe has been around for, for years and years. So AeroFit is just a version of that. And they all work. You know, it just depends on, on what you want out of it and what is going to excite you the most to actually do this practice. Okay, so third question. Um, you have one there. You, you have a device. Um, $15. That, that's doable for anyone. You have, you have to use it. You say, you're saying every day. So this is not like anaerobic training where you put a day in between. Um, how long every day and what exactly do you do? How do? What's the mechanism by which it works? So what they want you to do, and it depends because if you're, this is, has even been shown to be effective for sleep apnea because it helps tone the airway. So we have this airway, right? And it's covered with all these tissues, and muscle and cartilage and all that. Because we don't chew nowadays, because everything we eat is, is uh, you know, smoothies and avocados and soft foods, we don't, tone, we don't work out this muscle. We don't work out the airway. This helps to tone the airway. So in some studies, it's been shown to be effective for snoring and sleep apnea, uh, especially for snoring. And uh, for those, it's usually about 30 breaths once or twice a day. Not a huge, some of them have you do it for 10 minutes. Others have them do it for five minutes at the beginning of the day later. And, you know, it varies, but that's, that's around the therapy, which is so easy. The blood pressure one was 30 breaths, which is about, 
it'll work out to about five minutes of, of effort can lower your blood pressure that much. Uh, that just came out through the University of, of Colorado about uh, four months ago. Wow. Yeah. Good. Look, th this is why I always have the man on, folks. <laughs> we, we get this kind of knowledge that you just don't get anywhere else. I'm going to go out and get the device you have. I mean, I, I think... You know, I, I think it's worth a $15 try and I'll do it every day. I'll, I'll add it to my routine. I'll do it. If it says 30 times twice a day, I will do that. I already follow your prescription of, I know I'm right in the right amount of breaths per minute because at rest, I'm somewhere around six per minute, which you told me the last time, you know, I listen, when you guys talk, I'm here, I'm paying attention and it's still six, right? If, you, if you're down around six, a minute, you're doing well, right? Absolutely. You know, there's other things to consider volume, what you're doing when you're breathing six times a minute, but they have found that for people breathing at that rate, you know, at around 500 milliliters of air, it allows your body to enter the state of coherence and efficiency. So if you're breathing comfortably at six breaths a minute, in my opinion, that's about as good as you're going to get. And by the way, folks, when you try to measure that, the first 10 times you try, you will fucking go nuts because you will start thinking you're looking at a watch and you're thinking about your breathing and the watch is not moving fast enough. And you'll be around 11 or 12 and you're going to wait a minute. <laughs> I'm way out of shape. It doesn't mean any of that, right? No. And I want to be very clear. Six breaths a minute works for you. That's I bet your resting heart rate is in the 50s, right? I, I, uh, 50s right now, or 40s. Yeah. R right now, I, I consider myself out of shape. Of course, I was bragging about being on a rowing machine for, you know, 30,000, literally 30,000 meters in, in a two hour period. And I never came out of zone two. And um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm my, my resting heart rate is not an ultra fitness shape, but I'm probably around 45, 46 yeah. per minute. Well, well that's, that's pretty good, right? Yeah. And and they've they've shown that for every twenty beats, your heart is beating faster. That at rest, that will lead to sooner death. Okay, there there have been yeah. studies showing that, and a, a pronounced amount, like fifteen years. You know, so so you want to keep your your resting heart rate low is is a very good sign. But I want to be clear: what is working for you and what's comfortable for you isn't going to be the same thing for everybody else. So if somebody is breathing at 12 breaths a minute, that's great. If you're breathing a little bit of air and each time you're breathing six breaths a minute, instead of breathing um, half a liter, I bet you're breathing much closer to a liter of air in each of those breaths, which is great. Why is that great? Because your diaphragm is able to descend. When you breathe in a full liter in each breath, you are forcing your diaphragm down, which massages your organs, creates a lymph fluid circulation, other circulation of, of the blood and more. So all of that is good. But, but you know, I've seen people uh, breathing up to 15 times per minute. That is not necessarily unhealthy, depending on the volume of air, depending on their body shape, depending on their body size and all the rest. Larger lungs, you're going to be breathing less um, and getting more oxygen because of virtue of how large they are. So I just want to throw that out that just because you're not at six breaths a minute doesn't mean you're not totally healthy. We're, we're different people, different functions. Well, that's all good to know. Folks, like I said, you know, I promised I would only keep him 45 minutes, but here we are coming up on an hour. James, uh, I can't thank you enough once again for coming on. Hang on. I want to say goodbye to you uh, when I'm done here. Folks, you know what to do. We all go shopping on Amazon. You're going to all be going there to buy your, your breath meter. You, what, do you, what do we call these things? Power breath, um, uh, inspirator. Inspiratory muscle trainer. Power breathe is one brand. Arrow yeah. fits another brand. Just put in IMT training. You're going to see a zillion of these. Go get one. But before you go to Amazon, go to VinnyTotteries.com. I will be getting two of them tonight because... Uh, if I get one and Serena goes, whoa, 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 what are you doing there? You didn't get me one. Then I would be in trouble. So for me, I'm just, I'm just going to go all in and buy two. Uh, please go to VinnyTotteries.com before you go to Amazon. It puts coal on the fire. It gets my train down the track. We also have a super fan page. It kind of works like PBS. Um, I keep this show free. 
Uh, I don't actually get any of the money that you guys give me through the super fan page or the Amazon thing. It all goes into paying everyone that works around here that makes sure that this show goes up five times a week. So uh, thank you guys for doing that. Go check out James uh, Nestor over at um, <clears throat> uh, Amazon where his books are and his books are already in my book club. Uh, the one you're going to really like is the one where he talks about diving. Uh, the, these, it's, it's one of the most interesting books I've ever read. Uh, the, these guys that just deep dive. And um, we didn't go into that today, but just go check it out. It's called Deep. It? That's deep, right? Um, so go check out all of his books on Amazon on behalf of James Nestor. My name is Vinny Totterich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm. <laughs>